This video is a mixed bag of different things from the Unisketch and Blue Pill universe. I have two RackFusion Lives on my table today and a Blue Pill server, and the Blue Pill server and this Unisketch RackFusion Live will talk together. I will actually make them all talk together. This is a, a Blue, uh, Refusion Live with Blue Pill inside. So the difference is that these two in pair does the same as this one and vice versa. So you can get our products in uh, the Unisketch platform or the Blue Pill platform. This is the one that we are selling mostly going forward. But the awesome thing is that the Blue Pill platform is designed to include Unisketch panels in the mix. You just need to have them in the raw panel mode or Blue Pill ready mode. There are configurations for all of them. And you guys that know your Unisketch panels will know the, the firmware updater here. So you can go online configuration, download a configuration that says Blue Pill ready, uh, stuff like that, or, or just a raw panel. And then it will be... Uh, able to talk to the Blue Pill server or another uh, Blue Pill driven device. The tabs I have open here is for the Blue Pill server. I have a tab for the Blue Pill inside Rack Fusion Live. So you'll click Add Panel. Then there's discovery going on on the network and it's finding different units. Here you see the Rack Fusion Live on this IP is, I know that, this guy. So we won't choose that today. We are looking for the Rack Fusion Live underscore NKK, the, this one, the Unisketch version, which is an old beaten up version, by the way. My, I think, from maybe the first prototype even, has NKK buttons. So that's an option you can even get today if you prefer that kind of tactile experience over the four-way buttons that we have on the standard model up here. Four-way buttons are pretty awesome, by the way, and super flexible, as you will probably know if you have followed us for a while. But now I pick this one. You see it's uh, kind of taking over control by changing a little bit of what was in the displays, and I can also identify the panel like this. Uh, actually, um, the other tab was, was from, from this one, but there's one thing I want to do before, and this is the mixed back aspect. I want to update the software on this uh, fairly old version of the um, uh, reactor and uh, software. So we'll just go to packages for a while, and you'll always find that tab on uh, our system. So there is obviously a lot of things that we are able to update because here you see all the installed packages and then we could just start from one end and then update these. So you basically just press. This requires you to be online. If you're not online, it won't do this. But let me tell you what you do in your offline situations. You go to the website called devicesgahoy.com and here you can find all our device cores that are available for the Blue Pill platform and you can uh, click on them and then there's a hidden secret link that we do very little to make clear to you, namely this one. It's even in a darker gray color. But if you click here, you'll get a download file IPKS package that can now be installed on your device. Let me just see if we go back here. Uh, that's all fine. It just updated the, the Reactor instance. So now we can see Reactor, our panel management software has been updated. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of this page, you'll see Upload and Install Package. This is where you can then pick the file that we just downloaded down here, and then you can add that. So in your offline situations, you can install and update packages by getting them from this website. So there are a few other things that I would like to just quickly uh, update here. Let me see. We don't need any device cores today, really. Maybe, no, wait. Mm, hardware manager would be nice. Yes, please. Hardware manager is the binary that runs the actual electronics in the panel. So we have a separate binary application that are reading and writing to the, the electronics in the panel and actually providing a raw panel API that Reactor is using. And this is why this um, there's such a nice separation inside of the Blue Pill world with Hardware Manager being a, a self-contained component, Reactor being another one, which could be substituted by something else. So it's all running raw panel deep inside. So that, um, let me just update System Manager here as well. So we want a few of these updates done. This is also component-based that it's so easy to uh, to add your own applications into the mix and especially raw panel is becoming increasingly popular in um, in our customer base because it allows you to work with a panel uh, have it completely agnostic to what is connecting to it you can send um, colors and display content to it and you can read button triggers and joystick positions back from it and do exactly what you want so reactor is just our application that does that while a lot of our customers are already using raw panel to create powerful applications with our panels so I just got this updated and I want to go to the home screen and see how this one looks. Uh, it says that we have no device collection in this product uh, project. Okay, so we could create one. We'll, we'll get back to that in a moment because in fact, it is. it says in the panel uh, display here, it says that it's ready for connection from Blue Pill. So if I do a search again here for um, panels, 
I think in this particular version of Reactor, I may have a little bug that makes my um, me wait for eternity for discovering panels until I reload the web browser. So I just did. And now I see it's popping up right here. I'll select it. And we now see that the Blue Pill server has connection to the Unisketch device, and it also has connection to the Blue Pill Insight device. So two panels are connected. Let us just confirm first this one by identifying this panel. All white, that's nice. And then we try this one, all white, that's also nice. OK, so uh, I'm now connected to these two. And I've seen a software update um, progress. And I'm, I'm actually curious about trying to reverse this a little bit. So we could go over to the uh, RackFusion Live that we just updated here. And then in, let me see, let's just create this device collection. This is something that we are rarely asked. So I think you may not see. OK, let's just see what happens. OK, I'll just type in something, confirm. OK, I am unsure exactly what's going on. Maybe it's because this project is special, but I'll just create a new one for this uh, session on Mixed Bag. Yeah, Mixed Bag. All right, so I'll just create this, and it will. Did I not? Mixed Bag, add this, please. Oh, project file exists. How come? I don't see that at all. Save. OK, here is a little fix. I have, I'm just going to clear config directory of Reactor so I get a completely fresh install. This is something you don't want to do in normal situations. It will clear out all your work in Reactor. You will have no projects left. Absolutely blank slate. Don't do that unless you know what you're doing. But I did it right here because this is my development unit. And it must have suffered a lot of hardship from me. And it was on a very old version. And it appeared weirdly to me in the UI. So that's probably the reason. But here we are. This is the Rack Fusion Lite. It says unconnected. It makes sense in a, in a way, right? Because it's connected to the Blue Pill server. So what I will show you now is Hardware Manager and how Hardware Manager allows you like either we work with React inside of ourselves or we work with external clients connecting to me. And that's the difference of flipping these two around. Listen on socket means that now the React Fusion, uh, the React Fusion Live with Blue Pill inside will listen to its own internal software like Reactor, and it will disable connections from outside. So this change, let's just see what happens. This change is going to kick it off the connection to our Blue Pill server right here on this tab. You see it's now unconnected. And then if we go back to this one and we go to the home screen, you'll see that it has connected to itself and it's ready for local configuration. So let's just try to identify the panel. Yeah. So it identifies on its um, you know, own software now. And we can basically move the Blue Pill server away. And then we'll just continue the video working with this Rack Fusion Live with Blue Pill inside. So um, in, in the video here, uh, we have covered a little bit offline downloading of packages, how to update software, the, the ability of the products to either work with internal or external connections for the raw panel. And I want now to get us connected to some PVC cameras. And they are in our showroom. And we are taking our own medicine in our showroom. We have a Rec Fly Trio panel in the showroom that gives us um, ability to um, let me see if I can navigate here. You hold down the option key on your keyboard and drag, and then you can kind of navigate around in, in this simulated environment. We call it the simulator. And it is, um, in this case, this is a funny thing, and I'll get back to that. This is actually two panels, and only one of them exists in physical real life. You can see that on the home screen, that we are, in fact, connected to a RecFly Trio. And that is the one, while the other one, the RecFly Uno, is not connected. But we are still able to set it up, configure it, and use it virtually. So uh, the idea of this, my team who did this probably meant it to be located at a different position. It might be missing for demo or whatever, and they plug it in later, and then it's all good. But right now, this is the only physical panel that we have, and you'll see that in a moment. But it's doing two things. It's working up against a video hub router, and it's also working with a ton of NetIO devices. NetIO devices are network power devices, so you can turn on and off uh, plugs uh, for your equipment. 
And that is a super useful thing. You see that we have a ton of these devices in our showroom. So we have the main rack, we have a shelf or some shelves with stuff. We have a development PC we want to be able to turn on and off remotely. Control room one and two. And then we have a Blackmagic Design Video Hub here, which unfortunately seems to be unconnected. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, I am sort of surprised because it's, um, it is because it says it's unconnected up here. What I want to do real quick here is to turn on our main rack. So I'll just push this button. I'll turn on, let me see, maybe the uh, PDC shelf. Uh, also, showroom light might be nice because I don't know if there are people at the office this morning. And therefore, if I turn that on, at least I get something to look at. And in a moment, we'll see some devices appearing on the network so we can connect to those. So um, just to give you a little tour of this uh, panel, um, over here we have outputs. Output one up to eight, and I can just press the buttons and then I turn on and off that output on my unit. So um, I do believe this is located on this IP address. So let's just quickly check if the, this resonates with what we've just done. And I'm signing in and we'll see the main rack is turned on and the PDC shelf and the showroom light. So those are basically the connections that I had right there, there and there. And if you uh, then scroll over to the side, you see on the right side of the panel we have set up uh, first of all, some some information like um, coming out of the system, like uptime and the voltage, the wattage of the of the particular unit we have selected, and whether it's connected or not, all that kind of stuff, and um, ooh, an electricity bill I'm gonna get. Um, and then and then I have a little um, menu here where I can choose different devices. And notice there's even like a pager. So this is a standard configuration that we have made to work with the NetIO devices. We have six NetIO devices. I can choose between them over here. I'm on the main rack right now. And if I change to shelf power, then you see that I get you know different, different outputs that I can work with, different uh, status data from the, uh, from the NetIO device. If I go to development PC, I have a different thing. Now, this one would be a different model. It has four outputs. And then if I go to studio rack, again, something else. We have up to eight outputs on that one, et cetera. Maybe control room, what do I get there? Four outputs once again. So the different models that we are working with here would be set up on the home screen. So let's just look at that. And if we go to the individual devices, you can see under the NetIO power socket section in the devices side of the home screen. If you go in here, you see things like the IP address of the unit. This is the one that I just visited up here. So that makes sense to you, hopefully. It has a username, password. It has a model ID. And this is where you see the different models from NetIO that we are supporting. They are all listed in here. And if I go to development PC, I think we should see different model because there's a different model behind than there was on the main rack. So you can see those models are different. OK, but it doesn't matter to the application later. So the way this has been um, assigned to the configuration up here that says, um, yeah, actually, we'll look at that in a moment because I believe that we have added in this configuration for the NetIO on top of a video hub configurations, which is like the main thing on the simulator. Now we're getting a little bit into advanced territory, but um, let's just in investigate that in a moment. Maybe we could we could keep focus on what is happening on the RackFly Uno down here. So if we go to the home screen, you'll see that the RackFly Uno, which is apparently concerning itself mostly with the NetIO devices, have this device selector. It is running a config called RackFly Uno NetIO config. All right, so it has a device selector inside of which we have references to all the NetIO devices over here. It has device number one, two, three, four, five, six, and that is because they're all running on the same device core, but as device ID number one, two, three, four, five, six. Usually when you add a new device, you just do it by pressing this add button and then you can either find it on the network or you can select it from a list of devices you have already um, picked. This label is very likely to be the label that we actually get in the simulator. I don't know if I can get the simulator in a separate tab. Yes, I could. Oh, thank you so much, guys. That was super helpful. But these labels that you see right here are very likely to be the labels that we have in... Um, well, where are we? Okay, I think let's just make sure we get this up. Yeah, so we have now a tab for the simulator and we have this one for our device. Service. So now we are back again. These labels, let's just correct this to main. <clears throat> 
and we should now see that it says main shelf power so we can as we can put it back to main main rack if we think this is better and you'll see that it has updated right there so those labels are pretty easy to understand and the the paging uh, function over here of course will go to the sixth that we have listed uh, down here so setting up the different devices is super easy uh, we could probably even pick a color for it so if we do that for the first one it has a different color on the panel which is very neat if you want to group things up and that's actually one thing i want to do on this panel and then sometimes you have multiple configurations but right now we have one and that generic configuration this one this configuration is what drives everything everything you see on that lower row right here okay it drives all of that so this is something we have designed for you including this selector including um no wait not not including the selector actually the selector is a consequence of this one up here now this this um configuration is what gives you the um th this part with the status and also the changes you can do over here that that's what you get from that that one um <clears throat> If there is one, you pick that one. That gives you one way of driving it, but you can change that so that any device that you pick over here would have its own configuration related to how these buttons are being utilized. So that's a little bit on uh, how the device selector has been used to set up the six uh, NetIO devices. And I think we have given the whole thing enough time to boot up. So I will open a web browser and type in the IP address of our camera in the showroom. And um, here you see this is the Skahoy showroom right now, quite a mess. Um, but this is where we keep our devices, where we can um, have all our developers remote in because I am not at the office right now. I'm at my home office, but it still allows me over the network to work with any devices over here. And that is thanks to a Peplink VPN network that we have established between our homes and the office so that we are able to to do these um, configurations. Now, there we have the Rackflight Trio. That's the panel that we are working on in this web browser, actually. So I really would like to wake it up, and uh, <laughs> I should have somebody go and poke the panel to see if I could make that happen. So um, yeah, let's just zoom in a little bit more and then see if we can have a nice view of, of this unit. We should have a Skyhoy controller for this, shouldn't we? Maybe that's what we should do this morning. All right, let's just keep it at this and then separate this out a little bit so that I can um, sort of follow along here in on the side while having these tabs open and we can see what is happening over there. I, I think if I go back to my home tab here and I, um, I mean, what should I do to wake this up? I'm actually really not sure. See, this is a screen saving function, right? It's here to protect the panel from a burn in of different sorts that would happen over a long time. And especially for a rack unit like this one, that would be a good idea. Now let's um, let's go here. I think if I um, if I go to the canvas and I change the, um, the the brightness or maybe the sleep time, let's change the dim time at least to like 30 minutes. Save. Okay. Maybe that will wake it up. Doesn't seem like. Okay, I'm sorry, but to it's it seems like waking up the panel actually requires me to do a restart of reactor. So I'll just do that. Nothing was wrong. I just did that to make sure that the panel would come back to life so we can sort of see what's happening. We are happy now because we can go back to the simulator and we see a perfect reflection of the panel over here and what we are doing right here, right? So let's um, let's move over to the uh, main rack. You see now it was the same as pressing this button down here. I just pressed that and we are now at the main rack and we see all the things that are turned on. So I can just turn on a few more things from my simulated panel right there to make sure that I have enough device. I also want to go to the shelf power because that's another place. I know we have a lot of equipment on our network, so I'll just pick that and turn on these shelves. And I wonder if it can follow along this quickly, but yes, it does pretty much. All right. So on this upper row, we're actually having a video hub connected. And that was the one that we saw down here at the bottom of the device list. Now that I've turned on the network, it is connected. It was not when we started out. Notice that it was unconnected, but now it is. And I also wonder if we could have video hub control come up to connect to this one. Is that the right one? I think it is. Um, otherwise, I would have to set up the IP address on it. But this also helps me um, in a way because we could now just check how is, is, is that going to work if I go back to my simulator here 
and we look at the part of it that is dealing with the video hub. It says main rack up here. So that seems to be like indication of the output. Down here, you have an output select row. So if I say uh, wall monitor, it is now a different output. This one that we're dealing with, kilo view would be this one, Teradek cube, this one, mega panel would be this one, etc. Okay, so um, that seems to be pretty clear. So let's try to do some routing, a little bit of routing here. Let's go back to the main rack. And there we have reverse cam is being routed into this one. That source is right there. But if I change it here, you can see that it's also changing on the video hub. So in this sense, you can see this rack control or rack fly trio panel is um, us taking our own medicine, uh, adding adding this in. And we are currently also having a page here over here in case you have a super huge video hub. This would automatically give you additional pages of inputs and outputs. And those pages are coming out of something called a constant set. So um, just let's go back to, ooh, I sort of hate when I get these menus. I get so confused. I really much rather like to have it like this. By the way, if, if um, let, let's just go here. I want to show you another little reactor feature. If you get this, you can always go down here and select mini. And um, that was not super helpful with that one. Then you can then go to the, <clears throat> uh, on Mac, it's command minus, and that will decrease your web browser view of this one and it gets it out of that state. Okay, nice. We are here and we can look at the configuration of the Brackfly Trio. So uh, it's the, the cool thing is that you really, when, when you pick a configuration like this one, Brackfly Trio Video Hub configuration, and, and you can see we have something for other types of video routers as well. Then um, doing that, we can go into routing inputs and routing outputs. That are the two blue buttons that you want to know about that gives you easy access to configuring. And uh, in this case, we, uh, we have a, basically a list of input numbers on the input side that we, uh, we can organize. We can offer alternative labels. Uh, uh, we can uh, rearrange how they are put on the panel. And here are the outputs. Likewise, which outputs do we want to route to? We have set up 16 outputs, but we only set up 15 inputs for whatever reason. And uh, I really don't know why we chose only those, but <clears throat> still it just proves the point that it would be quite easy to make our own selection of inputs and outputs. So let's try to reorganize these. We can see shelf two and three. What if we wanted to swap those around? That would be really easy. Well, we kind of get adventurous because what we might want to do is to just put this over here in a web browser on its own so that we can see this is happening as we are doing it. So I go into the inputs and I say I want to move these around. So two and three are going to be swapped and you see two and three are being swapped on the panel. And trust me, that would happen in real life as well. So that was really easy, wasn't it? We could also assign a different color to it. We can, wow, this is working really great. This is really easy. Um, so you can go in here and you can just change these colors back to empty again. You can also, if you right click these, you can uh, d delete row, you can do that anywhere you want. And uh, you can also type in alternative labels. So what if I want this to be called my shelf? Oh, sorry for those spelling mistakes. Yeah. So super easy. The labels themselves are coming straight out of the video hub. So if you don't want to type them in yourself, you can also rename them over in the Blackmagic video hub. This is just an alternative name. So how beautiful is that? Muting, that's another thing you can do. Just temporarily take them out of the equation like that. The same is the, the case for the outputs. We have this output selector. We can also rearrange the outputs in a similar way. So you can imagine where that goes. Now, if we add more outputs here, we could add a few then we'll see that the page automatically follows along. So I'm just putting my cursor in here and I can press plus one on that one. So now we have basically for the um, for the output selector here, you can see that we're getting all the way up to, whoops, sorry. So if I get up to my page here in this end, you can see we end up at output 22. Oh, we need a few more to actually show the point, right? So now we have 23. 23. Oh, it, it, it could be output eight if we want. So there's nothing to say that we are not having uh, output nine would have a different label nine. Um, so there's nothing to say that we wouldn't have the same output multiple times. And now we have a page here that would go to this, you know, other page output 24 to 24. And then the 
24th output that we have made called marketing is basically this number 10 that we just added in. We could change that to something else and put in a label if we wanted to. Now, so that's just me playing a little bit around, but it also helps you to understand why is it super useful to have the default configurations that would automatically distribute inputs and outputs on a product like this one. This is called generators. It's a super advanced concept, but it is super simple in a sense. I mean, this is what enables simplicity on the home screen by giving you a simple table of inputs and outputs, sources on a video router, PTC cameras like down here have the same thing. If you want to add it, no, wait, that is the, it's driven by the same thing. We have a, a, a set of, we call it a constant set because we, we have like this list of sets of constants. In the system, this is, I mean, uh, sorry, this is a development thing. You know, we call it constants and what is a constant and so on. So it's just a table of information, right? And in here, you see things that are relevant to you. That is the device number of your NetIO device, devices from your PDC collection, inputs and outputs on your video router, all arranged in a table. That's a concept that you'll see a lot of times inside of Reactor. And it's powerful because behind it, we have a configuration that is drawing data out of that collection of um, information that we find on the home screen. And that's what makes this uh, controller run. We had nothing like that on Unisketch. And on Bluepill, we have it for these automated setups, used both on the video router and below. I think you have seen that we can route sources. We can also t turn on and off the NetIO devices. If you want to follow me into a really advanced adventure, we'll go and look at how the configuration is working all this out. And uh, actually, I know that this configuration uses the lower button uh, row for uh, presets, preset recall on the video router. Now I'm pretty sure that my team who made this thought to themselves, we don't need presets at all in the showroom. We just need to be able to turn on and off individual things and do some routing from the panel here. And uh, therefore, they substituted all everything on the lower row with the NetIO thing. I'm actually s suspecting a little bit that they used the RackFusion Live configuration right here just to have an easy way to slap that up onto the Rack Flight Trio. I don't know. I have not checked it. So this is absolutely freestyling on my part. So I have um, a few agendas here. And the, the last one and the first one we, we will investigate would be, could we have different coloring of these buttons. But instead of going into the table, which is what you would do, I would definitely advise you to choose this route, like going in here and then choosing the colors. That would be the quickest ever. But we just can't help to think, would there be a way to add the colors like once and for all for all the inputs and once and for all for all the outputs? And in fact, there is. But it requires us to dig deep into the machine room of reactors. So if, if you are ready for that journey, Follow me and uh, maybe you'll learn something on the way. Okay, so I, I think I'll just make this window slightly bigger for a while and then we go into configuration here. Uh, in configuration, we have a layer tree that is layering a lot of configuration for buttons uh, on top of each other. And we'll venture into the Rackfly Trio. We see this is the Rackfly Trio Video Hub config. It is drawing on a file that is in the system. So this is our default config in a, in a file. Uh, you also see that we have some properties of the layers. The constant sets are here. The, uh, these two constant sets with inputs and outputs are the ones that come by default when you pick that configuration. Then my team has overridden that on the home screen by adding only 15 and then 23 outputs. This is what is now on the layer above that. So these will override these. This is why these are grayed out. But if I removed, if I, if I had just chosen this without adding any entries into these constant sets, then I would see these um, be, uh, these not exist. And as I'm, I'm adding inputs and outputs on the home screen, they'll be written into the enclosing layer just above it. So uh, these are the default, these are the current values that we are having. The constant sets actually could be edited here. So if I click on this one or that one, you see exactly those constants that, that we had um, the other place. So I could type in the alternative label right here and you'll see this is changing on the panel. Um, but this is uh, done on the home screen. It's just to, to show you that the, the home screen is actually picking up the constant sets and showing them to you in that context. I wonder what about the key map here? Could be interesting to see. Uh, this is a pretty standard key map. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It maps panel one to panel one. Don't worry about it. It's not important in this case. This one would, yeah, okay. So, okay, let's just not look at that at the moment. What I would like to do is to um, move up here and uh, open this one up. Then inside of that one, we have a video hub configuration for input and output paging. 
And inside of that one, we have two layers, one for input select and one for output select. And there is a behavior defined called output pager. And the output pager is um, the behavior that you find right over here, this far away on, on, on this page here. Okay, so um, there you have the output page and the and the input page. Now, when I'm clicking this, it is showing me the generator. The generator is because this layer has it's actually in the structure itself in the in the JSON code. This layer has just an instruction to take information from our constant set of outputs and then generate pages above it. And notice what we have right here. Here's our out, and here is our input pages generated from our constant set. So what I am actually missing right now is like page two. So I think we should go back to the home screen here and we could add that additional page. We have 23 items and that's just enough to fill in the Ragfly trio all the way. So if we just add like this one again, 11, that's all fine. And we go back to configuration, you'll see automatically a new page has been created. Page number two was created by the generator down here. So. That's, the, that's what generators are. They are creating layers that doesn't really exist in the configuration file, but that are created like on the fly based on a data set, in this case, the constant set for the outputs. And that's what this configuration does. And that makes it a fairly complex thing. Now, um, one of the things that I <clears throat> was curious about seeing is the um, if we were able to actually change the, the, the color of the... Um, the color of the buttons generally. And uh, there is a reference here to output select behavior. And uh, I know this is in the JSON. This is not shown here. So again, this is the, the super advanced part of it. If we look at the JSON code that actually manages the behavior, and I kind of like that a little bit more in this case, we see the template behavior here is the behavior that gets copied the number of times that we have pages generated and automatically made behaviors for the, the buttons. And it is referring to a parent ID called output select behavior. And that is right there. The same is true for input select behavior. So actually, if I go in here and I edit that one, show more to get more information on it, then we should be able to have a little bit of fun with how the output selected master behavior works. So you see this behavior by default would show you out and then the number of the channel. But the reason why we don't see that actually is because somewhere in this conditional feedback, we have a condition that says if the alternative label is, let me see, different from an empty string, then it's going to do something different, namely show me the alternative label. That's what's happening in this uh, conditional feedback right there. So that's kind of good to know. But the title is not overwritten. So I could go and change the title just to show you guys that I can actually do something useful. So we'll just um, make this uh, output like that, submit. And then you'll see that the, the case of the title here is now being changed. because And it's changing all the way through. Why? Because I'm changing the master behavior. The master behavior is one that is lying underneath all the behaviors with the individual numbers for the sources we're routing. So we're just inheriting from that. And uh, you know that concept from master pages in Keynote or, or um, PowerPoint. So it's it's a well-known concept to you guys where you, you inherit a lot of things that if you change that in the master slide or in this case in the master behavior, it will be inherited everywhere else. So what about color? Could we change the color in this way? And uh, I would say, yes, we could. We could go in here and we could, uh, yeah, it was already done. So we can just see, hey, all the um, the colors on the output row here could so easily be just changed to any standard value by by doing that. In in a similar way, if you wanted these colors to be ones that, that would pick up the, um, um, the, the colors from the constant set and then still allow individual colors, you would have to make a conditional feedback like this that would be active only if that definition of color from the constant set is different from nothing. And then you would put that into the color field right there. So that might be an exercise for you. But um, right now, um, if, if I am to change this actually for the better of um, our everyday life at the office, we need, ah, I'm never too happy about the yellow color. I'm, this is not my favorite, just choose cyan color in this case. What about the input row? Let's just find a color for that one. Um, and I like the, the purple one a little bit. So how is that? Let's go and check it out on our cam into the showroom. You see, we have now fixed the colors so that it's sort of identified that we have something different going on up here than what we have down here. 
And by the way, I feel like cleaning up a little bit and let's just do that by removing some of the constants from inside of here. So we should be able to just delete the last rows that we are having on the panel. I think we had only 16 on this video hub, so it doesn't make sense to have more than those. Um, oh, by the way, if I wanted to do this in JSON, I could also have done so again by show JSON. Maybe that sometimes that's a little bit useful because here you have like sets. And in this case, we have, um, let me see. Yeah, there you have them 16. I think this one, the 17, we could also just remove it from inside the JSON. So if you are a JSON uh, fan, then you would just do that, save. And uh, now we would also have removed the 16. You see it says 16 now, and uh, it also has 16 entries. And if I go over here, we are limited back to 16. My remaining curiosity right now is how on earth did my dev team put that configuration for the um, for the NetIO onto the RackFly Trio? Because the RackFly Trio from the configuration looks pretty standard. It's uh, what we have been looking at here and overriding by changing the master behaviors down here for the RackFly Trio is, is one thing, but it seems to be super standardized what has been done here. So. I um I may want to check out here. So it's I'm pretty sure it has to do with the key map, because key map what that does is that it takes keys or aliases for our behaviors, the ones the names that we are usually using to define behaviors because they are more pleasant to look at as in in a, than a number. Sometimes they have a little bit of meaning, or we call a button A1 or X1 or. And the joystick might be called joy, joy UD for up, down, or uh, LR for left, right, and so on. So this whole mapping is basically taking, taking those keys and mapping them to actual numbers of hardware components on a panel. And I don't, uh, th and this is why I think things is, is happening. So I want to go down into the RackFly Uno configuration, which they probably set up to, to do this kind of thing. This also looks pretty standardized. It's all ma ah no 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 let's see notice what's happening here yeah 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 this is where they do it this is why they do it <clears throat> in the RackFly Uno configuration on this enclosing layer they are mapping panel two to panel two that's that's fine so um what is that panel one and two thing well I think that should make sense to you if you get this quick explanation the RackFly Trio has panel ID one this panel the RackFly Uno has panel ID number two, although we do not have a panel connected. All right, yeah, so that doesn't, okay, the home screen is not a perfect reflection of that at the moment, but if we look at what's happening here is that the RackFly Uno configuration has been taken in as panel number two. So up here, everything we do on the key map is mapping the aliases over to panel number one, hardware component 25, panel number one, hardware component 26, Etc. That's all you see in here. Straight vanilla key map. All right. Then, if you look at what happens on the enclosing layer, that is being mapped. Everything that is being mapped to panel number one on the child layers of the enclosing layer is now being mapped to panel number one in the real world. See, this is the way how we could. Let's just do that for fun. We could go here and change this to panel 30. <clears throat> it now has panel ID 30. Let's go to the simulator. It's gone. <clears throat> but I now go to the home screen. And in the home screen. Oh, shoot. <laughs> what am I going to do? Uh, well, am I at all at the right thing? No, I'm not. Let me just see. What have I done? What have I done? Oh my gosh. Oh, we're still here. Okay, nice. It's just that we don't see it in the simulator. That's fine. Okay, so now <clears throat> what I'm saying is that we still have the config right here. And the key map is mapping everything to panel number one. Down here on this one, we are mapping panel number one to panel number 30. And panel number 30 is somehow not on. Oh, it's right there. It's just hidden. Aha. <clears throat> so you know what? You also see? 
the home screen turned out to be clever enough to actually say, when I change this to panel ID 30, we need to go into the configuration. We need to find that key map that is mapping everything from panel 1 to panel 1 to panel 1 to panel 30 so that it gets over to the right place. If I change this one to panel 29, that would blank out. Let's try. Blanks out. I change that back to 30. I have everything inside here mapped to panel ID 1 being remapped to panel 30 here. So that was a long road to see what is then happening here. Now we have a panel two that doesn't exist in real life. So I think this one doesn't play a big role. And you know how developers are, you know, sometimes they just leave some stuff hanging around that is not necessary. And they know exactly that it's not necessary. So they are not confused, but the rest of us, we are. If you look at the key map we have here, it's like we have some redundancy because you can see that we have stuff mapped to panel number two, and then we have stuff mapped to panel number one. And that's the secret. So basically what my dev team has done is to say all the keys from the RegFly Uno configuration down here shall be mapped to output select one, two, three, four up here on, oh wait, output select one, two, three, four on this configuration shall be mapped to uh, ID number 49, 50, 51, 52, et cetera on the RegFly Trio because that is panel number one. And then later down here, <clears throat> they are taking everything for panel number two, and they are also routing output select one, two, three, four, five, and, and so on. So actually, I would bet that if you looked at this, you would find that all these mappings down here are, are just duplicates of all the mappings up here. So I am, in other words, or we are, in other words, taking every defined behavior inside the RegFly Uno and giving it two destinations. We are sending it to a button up here and to a button down here. In fact, we do have a chance to check this out because one thing that did not get corrected on the home screen when I was changing the ID was that it did not take into account that there could be cases where this is like hard mapped, like directly down onto panel number one. So actually, I would need to change this to 30. And now you see that whatever was here is now being routed up there as well. So I would have to go through and do this manually for each of these to get these keys, these, hot, these these behaviors being mapped up to panel number 30 on my RagFly Trio. And we are done with all the mapping. I think this has this should have been instructive to you guys to understand how the key map works. It's It's a concept you normally don't need to touch. If you're using configuration in the configuration tab in the home screen, you don't need to worry about key maps, but key maps are a very powerful feature that allows you to do configuration once and share it out on multiple panels. And uh, it was kind of used here uh, in a clever way by my dev team. And it gave me a chance to show you guys. And you know what? Now we have them confused a little bit on themselves because they'll come back to this panel and wonder who changed the colors and uh, why, why on earth did anybody change the panel ID to 30? And there's no better reason than for me to show you today how key maps work.